Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, thanks again for joining us um, for this panel. Uh, my name is Hannah Allen. I uh, completed my master's degree at the University of Maine in mechanical engineering in 2019. Um, and I currently work at the Advanced Structures and Composite Center as a research engineer, um, focusing on the floating offshore wind project that's been coming up in the news quite a bit lately. Um, as far as housekeeping, I just wanna make sure that folks know that you can enter questions in the chat box and we'll be happy to address them um, after a few um, pre-arranged questions that we have. Um, and I think that pretty much covers that for the time being. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna go around and have each of our, um, our panelists introduce themselves and uh, we'll go from there. So um, Allison, if you'd like to start, could you describe your current role um, or position, uh, your previous roles and, and other things of that nature? Hi, my name is Allison Dorco. I am currently a um, teaching assistant professor at Oklahoma State University. Um, specifically, I'm a teaching assistant professor of mathematics, which means I um, teach math. I do research um, specifically focusing on student learning from mathematics homework. And I supervise graduate students um, who are teaching other mathematics courses. Um, I did my PhD at Oregon State University. And before that, um, I did both a bachelor's degree and a master's degree um, at the University of Maine at Orono. Uh, my bachelor's degree is in kinesiology and physical education. Um, I was in the honors college and did an honors thesis for that. And then uh, my master's is in mathematics education from the University of Maine RISE Center. Um, I worked with Dr. Natasha Spear, who is also um, in the math department. And that, um, that master's degree really got me interested in, um, in the research. So that was the part, part of my life where I thought that a university faculty job would be awesome because I could both teach math and do research. Um, so I spent five years acquiring more fancy letters after my name. Um, and then now I am um, very, very happy as a math professor. Thanks, Allison. Uh, so we'll keep moving. I guess we'll go alphabetically here. So Anna Maria, would you like to go next? Yes, hi everyone. My name is Anna Maria Dogger and I graduated from the University of Maine in 2019 with a degree in biochemistry and a minor in microbiology. Um, while I was at the university, I was on the soccer team. And then after graduation, I had another semester of athletic eligibility. So I completed that and then worked when COVID was starting as a medical scribe. But then once COVID hit, all of that medical scribe positions were terminated. So then I began my current position, which is at the Maine CDC as part of the pandemic response team. I was initially working as a contact tracer and then began working on the contact tracer training team and the training team for a position called case notification. Um, and then as the vaccination effort really began to ramp up, the CDC created a new team called the vaccine team. And so I'm currently supervising that team and it's a public facing team where we answer questions about COVID vaccines for medical providers and for the public. Um, it's been a wonderful experience. It's ever changing just as everything is in this pandemic and it's challenging, but it's definitely worth it. Um, and then finally, I'll be entering med school in the fall of 2021. So that's where I am now. Thank you. Um, so BJ, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you. And I'm, uh, I'm glad to have been invited to be here. This is exciting to come back and revisit some of my I guess you'd call them roots. Uh, I graduated uh, with my master's degree in 2007 uh, from uh, the University of Maine in social work and uh, immediately started a graduate assistantship at CCIDS or the Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies, which I thoroughly enjoyed and, and, and learned a lot from. I then began uh, a career toward a PhD that I did not complete. So I have that, but I did a great deal of coursework towards that. And it was an interdisciplinary PhD at the University of Maine in disability studies, mass communication and instructional media, which kind of puts me where I am now. I am the director of instructional services for the University of Maine at Augusta. 
and I lead a team of instructional design and, and media services staff um, uh, uh, to support our faculty to create any kind of learning, uh, mostly uh, technology connected learning such as online learning. Um, I also work uh, 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 occasionally adjunct to teach uh, at uh, University of Maine at Presque Isle and the University of Maine at Farmington and online instructional design topics. Uh, um, prior to that, I was uh, at the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center as their communications coordinator and um, also uh, oversaw the uh, student, the government summer internship program, which some of you may be familiar with. And we also had a role from time to time in, 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 the, in the Cougar presentations. Uh, uh, the, the students that were in our, our internship program often participated in that as well. And then, you know, prior to that, I was at CCIDS uh, as a research associate too, working on really cool research projects that had to do with disability studies. Um, and I uh, want to give a shout out to two of my uh, favorite professors that um, doesn't look like they're here, but that's okay. Uh, that's Liz DePoy and Stephen Gilson, uh, pretty instrumental in, in my career success and my educational success. And uh, the, uh, I had them both as an undergraduate student and a graduate student, and they were my co-chairs on my PhD work uh, at UMaine. And Cynthia? I'm Cynthia Thielen and I completed my bachelor's of art in journalism in 2017. And I spent two years of undergrad doing work study with Center for Community Inclusion and Disability Studies. Oh, and that's how I managed to find my career now as an administrative specialist well, supporting the disability community so they can mm, be independent and, and live in the community any way they want. But, well, at first I started out doing photography and working for newspapers. Before coming back to Owenau, I spent time as a freelance contractor for the weekly packet newspaper in Blue Hill. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, so I think everyone touched on it a little bit, at least during their intros, um, but we want to get into it a little bit more. So if uh, we'll go around again, um, and if you could discuss your experiences at UMaine and research and how that shaped your career and uh, you feel it prepared you for career readiness and maybe getting connections or networking and other things of that nature. So um, I'll start back at the top for simplicity's sake. So Allison, if you'd like to go ahead. Um, some key experiences I had at the University of Maine that helped me um, land and continue to be successful in an academic job um, were the research experiences. So um, I was able to do an undergraduate honors thesis um, and then my master's thesis, um, I had excellent guidance um, such that I was able to get three peer-reviewed um, journal articles out of that, which um, really just speaks to the excellent advising I had because people are, I think, often lucky to get one publication out of a, a master's thesis. And those opportunities, um, publications are kind of, they're the currency um, in academia. They're the, the thing that help you get jobs and their research helps make a difference um, in the world. But having those experiences um, as an undergrad writing an honors thesis and then as a master's, um, a master's thesis and, and then um, I turned the master's thesis into the journal articles while I was getting my um, PhD. Those are opportunities to practice writing um, and to get feedback on writing. Um, and that made a huge difference for me in terms of just being able to research and publish um, independently now. Additionally, um, as a PhD student, um, going in to a PhD program with a master's from UMaine and research experiences from UMaine allowed me to give conference talks the, the first year I was a doctoral student. Um, and that helped me um, integrate myself into the, 
research community. Um, I remember being so excited the first conference I went to. As I said, I went to um, grad school in Oregon. Um, and so the first conference going to Colorado um, and meeting Natasha Spear and the other, the U Main crew at a conference was the first time I had seen people in like six months. Um, and it was just amazing to get to like see my, <laughs> see people from Maine. It felt like seeing family. Um, and of course, those people are all really well established in the field. Um, so that helped connect me through the five years that I was doing my doctoral work um, and just establishing myself really well in the research community. Um, and then the, I guess I'll end with the RISE Center has a yearly summer conference um, that I've been able to attend a couple times and uh, present at. So it's, it's just, a, um, it's just an honor to be able to just still be a part of that community and come um, see people and get to talk to other students who are working on their masters and saying, I graduated from this program. You can you can do this, you can finish and, um, and do whatever you want with it, whether that's becoming a standout um, middle school or high school teacher, because we, we need those people, we need good teachers. Um, or if you wanna get a research career, those are equally probable outcomes, um, depending on what you'd like to do. Thank you. Um, Anna Maria, would you like to go next? Yeah, of course. So I would say that just as Allison mentioned, research at UMaine has definitely had a tremendous impact on my education and then as my career as I'm building it currently. I think it played a major role in my acceptance to medical school and also preparing me for work in the CDC. So my first, the first research I did at UMaine was my freshman year, and that was through a course called Phage Genomics with Dr. Keith, Keith Hutchison. And it was one of my favorite courses of all time. Um, we were researching Mycobacterium smegmatis, and which is used as a tool to study Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So at the end of, of our freshman year, we had the opportunity to present at the Cougar Research Symposium, which was a great experience as a freshman. But I think what, what really I got out of that experience is that the introduction to research so early on in your education and the mentorship that, that I had from professors, it taught me how to think about questions and how to ask fundamental questions that would probe my mind and then ultimately allow me to solve difficult microbiology problems. So I think it's that way of thinking that that was really helpful in my career going forward. And then my most recent research, research experience was my senior year capstone project that I did in an immunology lab and was able to pre um, present at the Cougar Symposium there as well. And I think if I, if I were to pick the two things that I've learned most from these research experiences, I would say number one would be the critical thinking skills, which I touched on. And I think going into the medical uh, field, of course, that's something that's really important as you're diagnosing patients and as you're working with colleagues and doing research there as well. Um, and then I found it, it's interesting in almost every single medical school, or I should say every medical school interview and application, they asked about research experiences. And it wasn't so much what topic you researched, whether it was public health or it was medical research or engineering, but they just cared that you had that experience because it teaches you an unmatched level of critical thinking and way to think about problems that's crucial for the medical field. Um, and then secondly, the, the other point that I would touch on, and I think this is, is maybe the most crucial that I've learned from research, is scientific communication. And that's really evident in my role um, and with public health and at the CDC, because scientists, you know, spend all of this time studying really complex concepts, but then the merit and the value of their work can really be seen once it's able to be simplified and presented to the public in a way that they can understand. So that's something that I learned doing presentations at, at the Cougar Symposium and also in re research classes. Um, and then at my current CDC position, you know, some scientists are studying COVID day in and day out, learning about the quarantine periods, isolation, close contacts, the vaccines and variants. Um, but, but the way that we're really going to stop the pandemic is when we can convey these messages to the public that come from science in a way that they can understand and buy into and implement. So I think, so those are, those are the two skills I would say I've learned the most um, and are helping me certainly in my career going forward. 
Thank you. I, I think that's a really good point. Um, and I'm noticing so far at least that early and often is kind of the key for research um, and, and seems to be a good way for, for people who are uh, going to UMaine to get a leg up on maybe some other schools or um, other life experiences. Um, BJ, do you have uh, something you'd like to add? Uh, sure. Um, and I love, I love what I've heard so far. It's, it's, I think I couldn't agree more that, you know, these skills aren't only necessary, but there's so many tracks to take you know, the research education and the rest of your education, our education, to do any number of very cool things in the world. Um, for me, I'm going to go a little further back because my history with UMaine is, goes all the way back to when I felt like I was a mascot in one of the fraternities because my great-grandmother was a cook, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's the maroon building right behind, right towards the, 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 the river there. And so from a very early age, I knew I wanted to go to Humane. I, I didn't really think I could get there. I grew up with disabilities, uh, learning disabilities, and um, spent a lot of time in foster care as a kid here in Maine. But I, I made it, and uh, I started my undergraduate degree in social work with a, a minor in marketing. Uh, and the reason for that was I felt, you know, selling good ideas uh, social ideas was something that marketing would help me do in a social work career. My undergraduate research, um, uh, I was exposed to speaking at conferences with, uh, again, Dr. Liz Dubois and, and Stephen Gilson uh, when I would uh, uh, work on a research project with them. They would, in, they would get the funding to bring me along as a student to go to the APHA conference or uh, the AUCD conference and, and talk about the work that we were doing as a student, which immediately felt, made me feel empowered to present on uh, the work that I was doing, and particularly when I saw people ask me questions and they seemed genuinely interested. Um, in my graduate work uh, uh, as a social worker, um, I, am, I have an MSW, uh, one of the research projects I worked on uh, with uh, CCIDS was called the, the um, oh, oh, the tobacco access, it was a tobacco access project. What we did, and this is kind of interesting, is we translated English to English through a website. And by that I mean uh, we were funded by the Legacy Foundation to uh, present public health information related to tobacco cessation to more accessibly to people with different literacy levels. And what we learned in our research was the general health information around tobacco cessation was written at about a grade 13 level when most of the people who needed it read at about a fourth grade or sixth grade level. And of course we knew that you know people doing research want to sound like they're really smart when they write stuff up. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that information was accessible along with the website. So we generated, we worked with the math, uh, the computer science engineers at UMaine to develop a translation tool which, which brought the literacy level of the text uh, to a more accessible level. Uh, and it was a great project to work on and uh, to present uh, to the world. Um, and from there, you know, I would say m my research training has really enabled me to do what uh, Liz DePoy uh, burned into my skull, uh, which is, how do you know and so what? is to answer that question and, and, and not start with the so what necessarily, but really think about what's, what's the data that you need to look at, what's the literature you need to understand. And I still do that every day with small problems and big problems so that we're using evidence and thoughtful, valid methods to make decisions or to solve problems. And again, I, if I wanna you know, bake a new kind of chili, I'm not baked, but cook a new kind of chili. I will research chili recipes and see what the patterns are, what makes, you know, what are the options out there and what are the surprises that I didn't know about so that my, my problem can be solved and I can make an amazing chili all the way to trying to understand, you know, what are the valid and, and, and appropriate options for assessment of learning under particular kinds of topics or fields of study uh, so that I can create programming with my team to support our faculty to kind of understand the science of teaching and learning when it comes to, you know, assessment methodologies. So I use it every day. 
um, I, even with my kids, um, uh, when problems come up that I, I don't quite understand, then I need to do some research and come up with a method to solve a problem. Um, these kinds of skills have enabled me to uh, move my career forward in a credible way uh, and in a way that brings value to those I, I support. Thank you. I think it's, it's really good for, for people to hear that research has value beyond just the project you're currently working on. And we're, we're all certainly learning strategies and, and other things that apply to a variety of um, facets of life. So that's good. Um, Cynthia, would you like to speak about your experience? Well, my experience with my current career well has involved tracking down resources to help the disabled community, such as researching on supported decision making as an alternative to guardianship and data entry. Even though I now that I think about it, it does definitely relate to what I did in undergrad because I did a handful of classes researching well, news coverage and how to write. And reporters have to do a lot of research if they want to report the facts. So I think that definitely helps me need to figure out, well, how can I do research to help the disabled community? And well, I can really sense, well, I have a developmental disability diagnosis and have received support for years. So I have that perspective of what the community might need. Yeah, I think that's important to, um, to kind of know where you're coming from and where others might be coming from um, in, in the workplace and in other areas as well. Thank you. Um, so normally we would have some questions from the audience, but um, we don't have any questions. Uh, but I have a couple um, that I, well, one that we talked about earlier. Um, so how, um, and I'll say, we'll make it a little bit more freeform now. So if anybody feels particularly inclined to answer first, go ahead. Um, how have you dealt with failure in the past? I can go ahead first. So um, I, as I mentioned, I played soccer at the University of Maine. And when you come from, I'm from Maine. So I came from a small town in Maine, um, not much soccer competition, and then came to the division one program where I was playing with players from all over the world who are so much better than I was, to put it frankly. Um, and then I also came in to the University of Maine with an ACL injury, and then had another ACL injury while during my first year when I tried out for the soccer team. So there were a lot of kind of stumbles and in, in ways that I was feeling that I'm, I'm not getting playing time. Um, there are a lot of hurdles I have to overcome. There's a lot of work I need to put into this to get to where I want to be. So there were, um, I played practice and played and rehabbed for three years without getting any playing time on the field. So I was a practice player. I was putting in as much work as I could day after day, but still wasn't able to to find the success in the field, which is ultimately what all athletes want, um, is that playing time. So then after one particular game, my junior season, it was a spring season game. So if, if you're unfamiliar with, with um, Division I sports in the spring season games, usually people who don't get to play in the regular season get to play in the spring season. So of course, that was where I had my chance to prove myself was in that spring season. And I played, we had a few games that weekend. I played the games, then came back to meet with my coach um, the following week. And I thought I had done well. I was excited thinking, okay, going into my senior year, maybe I'll have some experience, some game playing experience. But what I heard from my coach was, was essentially the complete opposite. Um, I hadn't, hadn't done as well as I thought I had done. And then he listed off a lot of things that I needed to improve on. And so for a second, I was kind of hanging my head and thinking, you know, I've put in all of these years of work and it's still not working out for me. But, but, then, but then I quickly thought, okay, well, well, what can I do now to get to where I want to be? And the answer was that whole summer until we came back for, for um, preseason is to do everything I could to put myself in a position for success. And then I realized if, if I'm using all my resources, I'm working day in and day out to become the best version of myself that I can be then there's nothing else I can ask from myself. And so regardless of if that ends up in playing time or if it doesn't, that's how I can determine success for myself. And then luckily when I came back the next season, I was able to earn playing time and, 
and to earn those things that I wanted. But I think the real value was I felt that I had failed before. But then once I changed my mindset to thinking, well, if I'm going to be able to put in everything I can to become the best that I can be and fulfill my potential, then there's nothing more I can ask from myself. So I think in those difficult situations now, whether it's in school or in work, when I do feel something might be a failure, I can kind of look to this other side and say, if I'm putting everything, putting my best self forward, then, then that's ultimately success. I think I've found that um, failing at something often provides, um, as trite as this sounds, um, opportunities for um, for growth and for learning. So, as a um, as a doctoral student, um, I was taking some pretty difficult math classes, um, and I failed one of them. I had never. Um, never failed a class before. I failed an occasional test, but, um, but not a class. Um, I was first worried that I was going to get kicked out of grad school. Um, and so I called my, I actually called um, Natasha Spear, my, cause I, I was so scared to tell my advisor in Oregon that I thought I'm going to call my safe person in Maine and find out like what to do. And she said, they're not going to kick you out of grad school. Take the class again, you know, figure out what, figure out what went wrong and what you need to change to be successful. Um, and so that's what I did. And now um, I am, you know, looking back on it as, as horrible as it was um, to fail a class and feel like I didn't understand what was going on. Um, it was a good opportunity in that I am far more empathetic with my own math students because I, um, I know what it feels like to struggle with difficult math. Um, what's difficult in, in math or in writing is that varies for people, but the experience of difficulty is a shared experience. Um, I like being able to tell students, I've failed a math course before. This has not always come easily to me. And I know that you can pass too. We just need to figure out what you need to do differently. Um, so it's an opportunity, I think, for personal growth to figure out what is it that you need to change about your, um, your study habits or who you're working with. Um, sometimes in with college classes, you just need to take it with a different professor. Um, and that was something that I had never really believed before. People would say, oh, this person is a bad teacher. And I, 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 um, I would just think, yeah, maybe you're just like not a good student. Um, and so I learned that that's not true. There are people who are good teachers and there are people who are not. And that affects a student's learning. Um, and then I, I think it's important with failures to talk about them with other people because it does help you connect um, with people in a different way um, and just find out that everyone um, fails at things often. Um, and it's just, I think it's good to be able to talk about, particularly with so much of what we, we see with um, I think social media nowadays is just highlight reels that it's even more important to talk with people about um, failures and know that we're all struggling with stuff in a variety of um, spheres in our lives. So ultimately, you know, I think, I think the way I deal with failure is I just try again. Um, and that, that's an important attitude. You can almost always try again. We'll probably go better the second time. I think that's a, that's a great point. And thank you both for your answers. Um, Cynthia or BJ, would you like to address the question as well? Well, I, well, as a disabled student, well, I had to deal a lot with teachers not feeling as though I was going to amount to much. But I knew I had to keep trying. And well, my mother always said that as long as I set my mind to it, I could. So well, I, I was nervous when starting at Yuming, but I realized working my way into the Omo program was a great starting point and helped me to realize I can do this. So I kept going. And I eventually made it. 
Yeah, I think I think failure comes to people in a lot of different ways. Um, and certainly it seems like so far it's it's all about the attitude and, and trying to figure out a way to get through it, whether that's um, defining your own success or finding a new approach or, or what have you. Um, BJ, do you have a response here? Sure. You know, I like everything that's been said. Uh, I, I really, I think it's all good advice, really. Um, you know, facing adversity, you know, Brené Brown's research around uh, vulnerability and uh, one of her recent books, Dare to Lead, uh, the, the notion of rising up and dusting yourself off, and, but staying in the arena, you know, keeping, keeping at the work. And, and the other point that I think she makes very convincingly is that nurture, get a support section, you know, identify the folks who are genuinely interested in your success and stay close to them, um, because if if you're if you're in the arena and you're trying, as as particularly Anna Marie pointed out, working your tail off and not you know you you need you need that support section so you can brush yourself off, stand up, and get back to it, um, rather than walking out of the arena uh, uh, again. Brené's analogy and not continuing to try, uh, and I would say in my experience. Um, uh, there was a, uh, I think, a comment that mentioned, you know, what kind of supports did I have? All throughout my life, uh, my greatest support was always my great Grammy kitchen because when I wasn't, you know, in foster care, I was, I was on my great Grammy kitchen. So she was the number one support section for me. But I had some educators throughout all of my years that uh, took a liking to me and got in my support section and always encouraged me and and. Um, as somebody who struggled with reading and writing quite profoundly growing up, you know, the writing and the reading parts of education took me two, three times longer than a normal person. And so I learned strategies to cope with that. I would go to bed right when I got home from school and get up at 2 a.m. and do my homework because there were no distractions. Um, uh, and just do my homework through to the morning. And also the pressure of that panic monster, knowing that the homework needed to be in that day, helped me get it done. Um, but really, it's my best advice to anybody who's, who's, who's failed at something is to do exactly what Allison said. Look at it, where, what do I have to learn from this? And, and from Cynthia's perspective, the perseverance, the, the, the grit, as it's, I think, referred to in some K-12 literature, keep that, nurture that grit get that support, support section, listen to the advice from folks who are genuinely interested in your success because they'll be critical, but it will be for your best, so. Thank you. Um, so I think BJ kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, Cynthia, um, there was some curiosity about what supports and barriers you experienced at UMaine. When when the barriers that I had to overcome first was well, of course, making sure I got the right accommodations. But well, in for me there was usually note taking, but everything worked out well. And, and see, well, trying to find ways to fit in. Well, I joined a, a couple clubs like the well formal autism at Human Club, and I was a sister with Gamma Sigma Sigma for a time. But I think I think uh, finding a, a space you fit in at at you mean is um, it can be challenging for everybody for sure. Um, but once you kind of get a a feel for for other people with your interests or um, with similar backgrounds, um, the the gates really start to open up, and you find that that many clubs link to other clubs, or um, there's certainly something for everybody. At least that was my experience. Um, another question that's on the board is. Um, what is something you wish you did at UMaine during your education? And if no one has an answer to that, you could also say, what's something you're really glad that you did do? Yeah, I, I can, can start with that. I think starting with something I'm really glad I did do is is my experience on the soccer team because I think that gave me a sense an ability to persevere through difficult times but also gave me a support system as well 
Um, but something going off of Cynthia's point and Hannah as well, something I wish I would have done is to get involved with more clubs from more diverse and different different angles of the humane because I was very involved in the athlete athletic world, but there are so many other interesting parts out there and so many people and, and things to learn from. And as I apply to med school and I speak with other applicants, I can see their experiences and how they've been parts of many different clubs. And it's really helped to, to make them a better and more well-rounded person. So I think that's something that when I go to medical school, I'm going to bring with me to try to get involved in a lot of different types of things, because again, I think that can help you to, to see the world in different lights. Thanks. Um, anybody else? I, um, there were many places on campus that I just really appreciated. Um, so I spent a lot of, um, spent a lot of time swimming in the pool in the, um, the Wallace pool in the field house, which is a, a beautiful, beautiful, um, facility. I'm certainly glad I did that because it gave me, uh, stress relief. And that was, you know, I met people there. That was kind of my, my place uh, where I felt like I fit in um, the, I think it's called the Lloyd art gallery. Um, I knew that that it was, it's on the mall. I can't, Lloyd might not be the name building, but there's an art gallery um, that I knew if I just kind of needed like a couple minutes of quiet, I could always pop in there and it would be dead silent and there would be beautiful art to look at. Um, so I would frequently do that. And I'm glad that I took advantage of being able to just go into an art museum for free. Those costs a lot of money when you're in a city. Um, and then finally, one thing that I always really appreciated that I'm glad I just kind of gave myself like the, the space to and time to appreciate um, is the arches in the Stevens between like East and West Stevens or whatever it is. So there's those beautiful stone arches. My um, parents are both UMaine grads. So growing up, we came to homecoming every year. Um, and I have vivid memories of riding my bike as like a six year old um, on the trails out, um, you know, like the trails out that go toward um, Old Town. And, um, riding my bike or walking through those arches on Stevens Hall. So whenever I was on campus in the eight years or seven years that I spent between undergrad and grad school um, at UMaine, every time I got to walk under those arches, it just brought back good memories for me. And I think that those very small moments every day um, are just nice things to be able to appreciate. That's always good to hear, um, just the variety of connections that people can make with um, the community, with the, the, even the buildings. I mean, and the, and speaking about the trails and, and just the, the fantastic environment that we're so fortunate to have at UMaine. Cynthia or BJ, anything to add? I wish I'd taken in more of the there are still places on the on that campus I know are amazing that I haven't seen, uh, that I haven't been part of. Um, I had the fortune of both, I was fortunate enough to both work at UMaine and also study at UMaine. So being part of the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center, CCIDS, uh, as an employee, exposed me after I graduated to things that I never knew existed. And so um, I think, uh, you can always come back, right? And be a citizen in another way. Yeah, I think UMaine does a great job of trying to, to keep people engaged over time. And certainly the campus makes it worth coming back, I would say. Cynthia, anything from your side? Really, there will probably be some classes I never got around to taking, like maybe computer science. And I did see some of my journalism classmates take political science as well. And that definitely goes hand in hand with journalism right now. Well, maybe I could have tried sports. And well, I did help out with a couple sports teams in high school. 
That's <laughs> like a lot of things in life. You can't really do it all, but it's, it's uh, good to know that it's all, all there at UMaine for sure. Um, I guess in a little bit of a different direction, uh, Janet said, uh, does anyone think that having younger students, uh, for example, high school age, involved in research projects is a good idea? And if so, how could we involve them? So like early college programs? Yeah, that's what's... I would think that sounds yeah. like it makes sense. <laughs> so, so I have an 18 year old at Bangor High who's currently taking advanced statistics at uh, univer um, uh, UMM, University of Maine Machias. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about early college students in general, they're, my experience is that their life is different than a full-time college student who's of traditional or, no, or older, non-traditional age. And so an awareness of instructors uh, in any topic, but particularly research uh, around the pedagogies that work with that kind of population of, of people. Um, the expectation, I can say that, you know, the expectations of a college program um, aren't necessarily designed for, you know, younger students who haven't been prepared in that way. They're not, they're not, um, that's the, that's not the same culture in high school as it is in 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 college, and they they haven't they haven't had that typical first year experience process. So I, I think pedagogies around how we design to include them and support them to succeed uh, is going to require our faculty that are teaching those courses to have some training and, uh, around what those needs are and exposure to pedagogies that will be more effectively will more effectively include them. As a faculty member um, who does research, it is always nice um, to have helpers. There are all kinds of um, things that I need help with in research that often don't need a, um, a research background. Um, on the other hand, I worry um, about the expectations that we put on high schoolers. So I can only imagine, like, I remember how stressed out I was as a junior in high school because just plain old high school felt hard enough and time consuming enough. Um, and I worry what we would do to students' mental health if the new expectation for everyone to even get into college was being involved in research in, in high school. Um, so I think that the, um, some of the key things that we can really do to, um, to help high schoolers are things like that, um, that do help them learn to think critically and be able to go into research um, later. And those sorts of things, for example, statistics courses. Um, knowing statistics is hugely useful for sorting out the um, just the like the critical thinking skills. Um, it sets students up for you know to take the the research stats courses later if if going into research is a thing that they want to do. Um, advanced placement classes often opportunities often offer opportunities um, to refine writing, which is really important um, for research. Things like um, advanced placement history courses often have students looking at primary source documents. That's an early research experience, um, making and justifying claims from um, primary sources is ultimately what we're doing in, um, in research. So I think I would, I think I would hold off on having high schoolers involved in in university research, maybe during the, the academic year. I'm sure there are examples of good summer summer programs, um, but I it's always been important to me, I think, to put students' mental health first, and I just worry about the, the stress of, of adding more things to high schoolers' lives. I think that's a, a fair point. I know um, 
the composite center has in the past had um, high school students come in and intern and, and usually it's not heavily research based, but it's sort of like the exposure to the projects more so than like maybe actively participating in them. Um, maybe they're running some power tools or, or helping keep the shop clean and they're, they're hearing the terminology that's being used or, or things like that, but maybe not so heavily involved in, you know, reading research papers and, and taking on that level of, of stress or um, things like that. So it, it can, I think it can work, but I, I think your point is, is pretty valid. I, I would have to agree that the stress level in high school can get pretty high. <laughs> Anyone else on that topic? Um, okay, so the question that's in right now is, um, if anyone has advice for online grad students that are not much involved in direct research, um, but would like to pursue research um, long term. I don't have experience in this. Does anybody else? <laughs> Um, professors often can offer, um, reading credits and those are just sort of a general, um, you can do whatever you want with it. So if you are doing, um, an online grad school online of some sort, I would reach out to a professor who's area of research is something that you're interested in and try to set up some sort of, research or reading credits, and then you would get a chance to define. So maybe your goal is to um, write a lit review for that course, or maybe that professor has some way that you can help out in those research in, in that research. Um, but those credits are sort of part of the academic system because it's a mutually beneficial thing for graduate students to get research experience and professors sometimes to get help um, with our research. I, I learned something new today. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Um, anyone else have anything to add on that? Um, okay, I have a, a multifaceted question. Um, so I, as, as a human, I'm always curious to know um, if uh, where people are currently is where they thought they would be. Um, so uh, generally, is the job you have now a job one you knew existed um, and or uh, a job you thought you would have. Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, so I would say the job that I currently have, I, I did not expect to exist um, in that or expect that I would be part of. And that's because it's a job that was put on by the pandemic, of course. Um, but in the sense of the type of work that I'm doing, so as a contact tracer, I was making cold calls to people who are exposed to COVID and then explaining quarantine to them and symptoms to look out to. Um, and then in my current position, I'm calling people who have asked questions about the vaccines and who, who, who can be in a lot of um, a place where they're very worried or they're concerned and they have a lot of questions that they need answered. So in one part, that's something that I was hoping to do, which is to be able to provide, to provide comfort and provide answers. And that's something I hope to do in the medical field as well. But in another sense, um, doing these cold calls and spending all of my days on the phone with people, I would say as someone in, in my generation, I don't think people my age are very comfortable speaking on phones often. And I can say that I'm one of them or comfortable making cold calls or um, with these communication skills because of things like social media and online communication that we don't, we're not necessarily as good at. So I think when I took this job, it was putting me outside of my comfort zone in terms of being able learning communication skills that I knew were necessary for my future, but that I didn't have at the time and weren't comfortable for me. So it's certainly a job that I wouldn't have thought that I would be in, but I think it's what I needed to be in to help prepare me for a career as a physician and to gather these communication skills that I really didn't have previously. Thank you. 
I, I think that's really interesting. And I don't think uh, anybody necessarily thought that your job was going to exist, at least not this soon. <laughs> um, anyone else want to answer? Well, I can pretty clearly say I did not expect to end up as an instructional services administrator at a university, given that I had a degree in social work. Um, uh, but really, it was because of all the extra, not the extra, the, the, the other things I did in my other education, which included research. Uh, it included graphic design, web design, database design. Um, I was a pretty odd social worker. And in all of that work, and then teaching as a graduate assistant, um, I, I found my way into the thing that got me here, instruction. You know, the, supporting uh, the apparatus and the practice of instruction at the university. And all of those skills around understanding validity and making valid arguments and uh, looking at bodies of literature to see where we are on a topic and where we aren't and what exciting question could I ask about that to contribute or answer my question um, turned into uh, just an incredible curiosity around how to make teaching and learning uh, more inclusive, uh, more accessible, um, and uh, I just thoroughly love the job of supporting my faculty to be their best selves as a teacher. And um, that's a good day, I think, for my team. Uh, you'll, is, uh, we'll often hear kudos in our morning stand-ups where it says, I helped solve this problem today. I helped solve this problem today. This person asked a question and we figured it out. And, and generally they're talking about faculty. So I didn't think I'd be here, but if it weren't for those communication skills, for those um, um, analytic skills, research skills, uh, I don't think I'd be able to credibly provide the service that we provide. Um, Allison or Cynthia? Well, I knew that my job existed due to my previous experience with work study. And the person that was in my position before happened to be my work study supervisor. And at the time, I couldn't quite imagine being in her shoes since it seemed like she did so much. But then once I moved back to the area, I was offered the job, and I figured since I already had some experience, it was a good fit. Good. Um, growing up, I thought that my goal was to be a, um, a chemist and work at the Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor. Um, I did get to work at the Jackson Laboratory as, um, as an undergrad for a summer. Um, I had no idea that I would go into math. It turns out I don't like it when things go wrong in chemistry and then you have to spend all kinds of time cleaning up and start things all over and it takes like three hours where in math when something goes wrong I just take the piece of paper put it in the recycling bin and start over. Um, so I did not know that I would end up as a math professor but I knew from an early age that I would go into something math or sciencey. I think one of the, um, the beauties of a college experience is you get to figure that out and you get to try a whole bunch of things and figure out um, what you're good at, what you like, um, and what you want to spend your time doing. So you try things and um, if it you know, feels like a good fit, that's good, good news. And if it feels like not a good fit, that's also a great experience to have. I definitely agree with that. Um, it's pretty easy to get to this point where you're, you're very like set on what you want to do. And then when you get there, it's not what you thought it was. And um, it can be challenging to kind of accept that you want something different from what you always thought you did. So I, I think that's, that's not an uncommon experience for sure. Um, Cynthia, there's a question in the Q&A. 
um, that was specifically towards you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you wanted to answer either verbally or feel free to type if you'd rather. Mm, well, I think. So well, I think they question? wanted me to mention how, well, I had taken a graduate course about a year ago for New Hampshire maintenance program that focuses on how, how to help disabled people in the community in public health. Policy. Well, I, well, I think that does in a way help. It helped me with my research and my current job. Help me to understand the projects that my coworkers are currently working on. Yeah, I think um, even partial. I don't know if, I, if the terminology is correct, but even like a partial completion or work towards a degree can be um, sometimes equally important as um, getting all the way to that degree completion. Um, I think that can be really helpful. And certainly, you know, it's, it's a, a learning experience um, all the way around. Um, Mindy, I don't know if, uh, I don't have any other questions and I, I'm not seeing any further in the q and I don't know if you want me to close or. Yeah, this has been great. We can go ahead and close. Thank you all for coming. Well, thanks everyone for attending and, and listening in and participating with your questions. And um, thanks to our, our panelists for participating today and, and giving some great responses. I really appreciate getting the opportunity to meet all you. I hope we get to see you again. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. It was so nice to meet all of you and hear all of your perspectives. Bye. Good to meet you all. Thank you. It was great meeting everyone. Have a good day. Have a good day.